Hey everybody, I'm Ben Mankiewicz. Welcome to TCM. Thanks so much for joining us on a significant day. It is uh, June 6, 2019, the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. That is why we are here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans and why I am joined by Rob Satino, the senior historian here at the museum. Rob, thank you again for joining us. Great to be here, Ben. We just saw the longest day from 1962, the Daryl Zanuck production uh, detailing pretty accurately uh, the events leading up to and immediately after the D-Day invasion on June 6, 1944. I think this is a wonderful bit of programming from our programming department because the next film we are going to see is also essentially about the D-Day invasion called Overlord, a British film from 1975, but this couldn't be more different cinematically from The Longest Day. I watched both these films in succession, as it turns out, that is Longest yeah. Day first and Overlord second, and I was struck at the different ways that an artist or a group of artists can portray the same historical event. The Longest Day is an accurate film, and we yeah. talked about that, but you know, so too is this an accurate film. It just tells a personal story, the story of, of one individual rather than the gigantic sort of mega tale that, that The Longest Day tries to tell. I think that's why it succeeds. Also, about half the film is newsreel footage, documentary footage. And that's, again, what to me, what gives this film its kind of special characteristic. You're, you're, you're watching this, this young man, we'll say, go through training and kind of stumbling around. He's a bit of a sad sack, we would say, in the U.S. military yeah. context. This is no great, great no. warrior. Right. But juxtaposed with that story, you're seeing incredible scenes of the machines and the technology of war in action. Aircraft, dive bombers, fighter planes, attacks on trains in the countryside. We see a British bombing raid on Berlin, and we see a German bombing raid on London, so it looks like. And that, to me, is the contrast, this one like little guy and, and then the gigantic machines around it. I think it's significant that we see the uh, British bombing raid on Berlin not merely because it's, uh, it's you know, made in 1975, it's not uh, designed to uh, get British fans out of their seats cheering. Uh, I think it was merely to show that, uh, look, this, uh, the, the bombing of civilian populations, because we see the brutality of the Blitz, there's some amazing scenes of buildings crumbling on firefighters right. uh, in London. Uh, but just to show that uh, the bombing of civilians obviously went on on both sides. Yeah, you know, that's the thing about war, and particularly modern war, the violence ratchets up on both sides. So there's sort of a series of reciprocal actions, and right. it gets worse and worse and worse, and certainly this, this war did. Uh, I, I want to mention the cinematographer here. It's John Alcott, and, and the way that he and the directors, Stuart Cooper, blended the original stuff that they shot with the newsreel and documentary footage is... I, I mean, it is a, a remarkable blend. I'd look away for a moment and then I'd look back at the screen and have to figure out whether I was watching right. a period newsreel or this, this uh, freshly shot footage. And so it's, it's absolutely seamless. At the end, it's like you watched an hour and 20 minute long newsreel from World War II. It is worth mentioning that John Alcott won the Oscar for cinematography for this year for Stanley Kubrick's uh, Barry Lyndon. Mm -hmm. uh, not for this film, but I gotta tell you, it could have won for either one. Some of the realism of the film we're talking about is that that period footage, you're going to see a flail tank in action. What's a flail a, a, tank? So you have a tank and you have a rotating cylinder in front of the tank with chains attached to it, and it rotates very rapidly, and the chains are whipping around. And, and the flail right. effect is designed to explode mines in front of advancing infantry. That's right. Now, yeah. Yeah. I've read about the flail tank my whole life, but I saw more footage of it here in this film than I think I've seen in my entire career. And I recalled it as soon as you said it. I, I am certain that I had never seen that yes, before. Right, right. So it's one piece of the technology after the other. And if, if for no other reason, if, if you are a, a interested in the sort of state of technology and the, uh, uh, the transformation of technology in World War II, that's an angle that you'll get in this film, quite surprisingly, given its kind of interior focus. Here at the National World War II Museum, uh, you said you, you, you all have done uh, 10,000 interviews with uh, soldiers, yes. right? Uh, people who served in some capacity, not, not just soldiers. Um, but there is also, as you see behind us, there is a lot of the machinery of war here and a lot of descriptions of the machinery of war. What has been your experience working as a historian at the museum and what would you tell people uh, who you want to encourage to come visit the museum for the first time? So we have artifacts and technology and we can see some of them here in this very room. But it is that search, I think, for the personal experience, Ben. The, the, those 10,000 World War II veterans whose stories we have captured, because there's 
There wasn't one World War II. There, there were 16 million World War II's, the number of American men and women who donned the uniform, and, and then another 120 million on the home front. Everyone experienced the war in their own way, and to, I think, to believe there's a kind of narrative we can put together that will that will cover all of that is very naive and a little bit uh, a little bit arrogant. And that's why I love sitting down with the individual oral histories and listening to what some soldier, sailor, airman, home front worker, just what they went through in the course of World War II. It's filled with with shock and it's 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 filled with surprise and it's filled with emotional moments and and other times you just can't believe what you're hearing so you know there's 16 million films re ready to be made and i don't think we'll ever reach that but uh, this movie overlord did a wonderful job at one of them all right rob thanks very much you're welcome here's the film from 1975 directed by stuart cooper overlord <laughs>
Where you been now? Bus goes in 15 minutes. The farm. I had to get this back here. I'll want something to read. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm already upstairs. Your mother's up there. What's the book? Oh, David Copperfield. You'd be lucky if you have time for reading. I never did. Has he got everything? Of course, he doesn't need much. What do you mean, he doesn't need much? Well, they give him the rest. Clothes, rations, you know. <sighs> Bye, Mum. Good luck, son. Just it. Seeing now, dearly beloved brethren, that this child is born again and received into the family of Christ's church, let us give thanks unto Almighty God for these benefits, and with one accord make our prayers unto him, that this child may lead the rest of his life according to this beginning.
you for the camp? Hey, you. Are you for the camp? Yeah. They're a bit late, son. The others got in last night. I know. I got caught up in that air raid, eh? Yes. Oh, well, never mind, son. You'll have to walk. <laughs> it's not many miles. Put the case down. Name? Thomas Beddoes. Sir? Thomas Beddoes, sir. You're late. Do I look like an officer? No, sir. Don't call me sir, then. Who gave you permission to fall in? To what? To enter, to come in the room, to open the door and make an entrance. No one. Get it right, then. Go back outside, knock, and when I say yes, come in and say permission to fall in. Go on. Beddoes, your case, take it. Yes. Who are you? Beddoes, permission to fall in. Come in, Private Beddoes. You can have that one. Leave that. You're late already. Haircut's next. You'll find the barber shop next to the company office. Next. Stand still. Stand still. Next. Next. Name? Better, sir. Skinny, aren't you? Yes, sir. Got a cough? No, sir. OK, close on over there. Next. Are you going to stick that in me? Arm, please. Feeling better, are you? I don't like needles. Is that all? I don't like the old sword in army. Can you tell me what you've got there? One pair of shorts, PT. One pair of drawers, cellular. One balaclava. One pair of braces, one pair of boots, greatcoat, socks, vests, gaiters, webbing, packs, large and small, battle dress, gas mask, mess tins, mug, knife, fork and spoon. Anything else? I don't think so. What's this? 
It's a pull-through. You're learning. OK, all of you, you're going to keep this lot so clean it dazzles me, and you're going to start now. Let's get two things straight right away. The first thing, the word of command, stand easy. You will not move at all until that word of command is given to you. You will not fidget, move about, or anything else. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Regimental Sergeant Major Palmer. Right, any questions? Regiment 1685. Yes. What for? I mean, was there any special reason? What do you think? I don't know. To impress the French. Right, tell us what you've been doing. Stand by your legs! Beddoes, isn't it? Yes, sir. What haven't you done, Beddoes? I seem to have neglected to blank with the belt underneath the buckle, sir. See to it next time. Yes, sir. By the right! Back! I need a fake. They're ahead. Will you go on? I'm stopping for a smoke. I hate this war. You'll get through. No, it's not, eh? It's me girl. We was engaged, see? And, and then, when all this come along, well... Her old man wouldn't let me marry her. 
sold him. So we could wait till after we won the war. <laughs> Bastard. He let the Jerry's poke his wife after as much as knocked on the door. Wanted to fly. Failed the medical. Didn't know that. Who you got waiting for you, Tommy? Who have I got? Well, there's Mum and Dad, I suppose. And Tina? Good for you, mate. <laughs> Let me guess. She got brown hair, brown eyes, pale skin, nice tits, right? Tina is a cocker spaniel. She's a lovely dog. A bitch. Yeah. A bitch. What are you going to do when all this is over? Oh, I don't know. I've got me plans. Garage, mate. I'm going to buy a garage somewhere around here and set up scrap metal business on the side. How about coming in with me, Tom? Hey, we ought to go. Come in with me and the lads tomorrow. We're celebrating in the training. Pub crawl in the afternoon, flea pit in the evening. Yeah, yeah, OK. What's the film? Forget the picture, mate. It's a women. You get next to a nice piece in the back stalls, you'll be away before the tiles come up. <laughs> oh, for Christ's sake. They've got at least ten minutes on us. You think so? <sighs> no bleeding navy for us tonight. I'm going down. What, down there? Yeah. Hey, don't do it. You kill yourself. Private Meadows, fall in. Zero nine hundred hours, you will parade at the main gate where you'll get the transport to take you to your units. You'll be back here by twenty one hundred hours, or your mother won't recognize you by the time I'm finished with you. Forget what I have told you. 
And you won't be around to write me a thank you letter after the war's over. Making a signal, Beddoes? Only for victory, Corporal. This is Movie Town.
though, Jack. All by ourselves, are we? You're a solitary sort of geese, aren't you? I felt like reading. Christ, I wish this fucking war was over. You spill your blood and guts to help the Belgians, and then four years later, you get ready to spill them again to help the fucking French. And in between, you go paddling down on the south coast, learning how to keep your bloody rifle dry. <laughs> a fucking mix-up, if you ask me. I've been in His Majesty's bleeding forces four and a half years, seen active service, and now they want to send me back to beaten battle school. You know what that means, don't you? No. It means we'll be the first ashore when they do put on the sodden invasion, that's what. I suppose someone's got to go first. It's no fucking joke. You will now be taken to the coast, where you will be joined by Allied forces and take part in combined exercises and assault training.
were instructed to hold tight to ram the beach. This is a bloody nightmare. I feel sick. Watch out, we're going in. Stand by to hit the beach. It's a lovely crumpet, just waiting for it. Are you ready? Have you got any cigarettes? Freemans again. Yeah. Take it. Right, Pete. Uh, I'll follow you. <laughs> Early tonight, lads. Got any wine, have you? Wine? Oh, two pints of brown ale, then, please. Vintage? Look around, my boy. What'd you see? Half the regiment. Yeah. So. How long are you lads going to be around here? Oh, we're not going to be around much longer, do we? Oh. Have you been here long? What, sitting in this chair, you mean? No, here, generally. About as long as most people, I suppose. Oh. And you? What? How long have you been here? Just arrived, really. But, um, I don't think I'll stay long. It's a bit dull, don't you think? What's dull? Dances, all this. I don't think dancing's dull. Oh? Huh? Then it... Uh, will you have a dance with me, please? I don't mind if I do. Is that any better? You're not as bad as all that. Shall we go outside for a bit? What for? The rain stopped. All right. Is this your yes. coat? Not really. What do you mean, not really? Well, I've been on training, and that was tough. Really? Yes. 
Do you like it? What? Being a soldier. Not much, no. Then why are you? A soldier? Mm. I was called up, like everyone else. Is that all? No. It's got to be done. We've got to finish it off and pay out the ones who started it. Yes. I think you're very nice. Do you? Yes, I do. I like you, too. I feel much better now. I was quite nervous when I first talked to you. It's funny. I know. You thought the dance was awfully dull. I didn't really. No? No. C can I kiss you? If you want. I've got to go now. I'm with my brother. He's in the band. Oh, no. But when can I see you again? Whenever you like. Not tomorrow. Monday? Yes, I'd like that. Here at six o'clock. All right. Will you walk me back to the hall? Anywhere you like. Back to the hall. I wish I'd met you before. There's so little time now. What do you say that for? I don't know. It's just a feeling. You'll be back, and there'll be time. Where are we going? I've lost all sense of direction. A game of musical bloody chairs, mate. Thousands of us moving around from camp to camp, waiting for someone to shout, check in front, last one over's a Charlie. First one over's a Charlie, if you ask me. You'd think they'd have a bit of sympathy for us by now, wouldn't you? Send us by train. The GI told me where to find sympathy. It's in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. <laughs> From here to Lancashire and then to Salisbury Plain And then we got to Somerset and now we're back again We'd like to settle down, we seem to hope in vain For someone's passed the word along, we're on the move again We don't know where we're going until we're there 
lots and lots of rumours in the air We heard the captain say We're on the move today We only hope the blinking sergeant major knows the way Bad in Somerset where the cider apples grow. It's not so bad on Salisbury Plain with a Mary Jane, you know. It's not so bad in Lancashire a couple of weeks a year. But oh, crikey, where do we go from here? They've chased us round and round the barrack square. And now we're on the road. No one's in the know We're singing as we go Oh, we don't know where we're going until we're there You won't be doing any work. If you're wise, you'll take advantage of it. Sorry about the tight security. It means no wireless sets, newspapers or telephoning, and I'm afraid none of your letters will get posted until afterwards. I'm sure all of you realize the importance of what lies ahead. That's all for now. All right, Sergeant Major. I thought you were meeting me tonight. I was called away. Why? fight the war. Couldn't you have told me? There was no time. So you left me? There was no choice. Are you coming back? Don't know. Am I going to wait for you? I don't know. I do, though. Goodbye, Tom. Please. Don't go. Fill in the form, please. Name and address of next of kin. If I get killed, they've already got a photograph. It's for our records, Private Bellows. Oh. And follow the sign outside, please, and get your anti louseware from the stores, if you haven't already. God. How much more? There's a will form, B2089, to fill in. What for? What do you think?
Cannon fodder. That's what we are. Dive boredom. Dying battle. What's the difference? Did you hear what Tom did this morning? No. He went to see old Nickleby and asked him if they gave our compassionate leave if there'd been a death in the family. So Nickleby said, well, yeah, yeah, depending on the circumstances. And Tom said, well, there hadn't been a death in my family yet, but there's going to be one very soon. I'd request leave to go home and console my parents. <laughs> <laughs> what did Nickleby do? He sent Tom with a note to the M.O. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tommy, he's nuts. No, 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 Tommy's not nuts. We could do with a break. Well, we could all do with a break. It's been nothing but film shows, housey housey, and lemonade and the bleeding naffy when the beer runs out. Ah! Ah! Wait for me. Don't tell me it's your birthday. Yeah. A couple of days ago. The mail's held up. What's that? It's a key. It's a funny sort of birthday present. What's it for? Well, it's a custom in our family, you know. Key of the door, coming of age. You know the sort of thing. You're just 21. Yeah. Happy birthday, kid. Plenty more of them. Thanks. How about this, Jack? Oh, that's nice. I think I'll go and get some ink. I'm right back to them. Can I have a look at your cards? Yeah, help yourself. I'll see you later. Army Post Office, England. Dearest Mum and Dad. Thank you very much for your letter and the presents which have just arrived. My fountain pen works very well, as you can see. We're very cut off here, as you can see from the address. I don't know where we are exactly. And it was so nice to hear from you. You don't have to worry about me. We are eating very well in this camp. Although the beds are hard, I'm getting plenty of sleep. We all think the invasion can't be far off. It's like being part of a machine which gets bigger and bigger, while we grow smaller and smaller until there's nothing left. I wish I had some news. Yesterday I saw a fox on the other side of the barbed wire. And when we could still go out, I went to see this happy breed with Celia Johnson in it. I thought it was terrific at the time. But I can't remember much about it now. It seems so distant. Everything outside the army and my mates here has faded away. have done even more traveling the last two weeks than when I went to France on that school holiday. But I couldn't tell you where we are or where we've come from. All we seem to do is sit in trucks and barracks, 
waiting for our bit of the war to start. At any other time, your news about Tina would have left me unable to think of anything else. But now it just seems part of the war, like everything else. I was going to ask you to keep one of the puppies, but I don't think there's much point. I don't think I shall live to see the end of this war. It sounds silly, but this war has killed so many people already. I'm just going to be another one. Of that, I'm sure. I can feel it, the way you feel it when you're going to get a cold. I didn't know whether to tell you. I thought you shouldn't get one of those official letters without knowing what was inside. Please be brave. I shall be all right. I'm not frightened.
necessary to burn all personal letters and papers or wrap them in the paper being issued to be sent home. The choice is yours. You will carry nothing except your paybook part one and Bible. got nothing now. I've thrown it all away. I don't think I'm going to get through this. You'll be all right. We'll get you through. to this lot. So much for the seaside.
Susanna. Please, Mommy. Sing it right to once more for the soldiers. So let him go, let him tarry, let him sink or let him swim. He doesn't care for me, and I don't care for him. He can go and get another. But I hope he will enjoy. For don't go, Tommies. Tommies, please don't go. Be sick again. Why didn't you become an officer, Jack? I feel the initiative test. They locked me in a broken down potting shed and told me to imagine I was a prisoner trying to escape. If I used that wall, I'd be shot. If I climbed that fence, I'd be electrocuted. If I trod here, there, anywhere, I'd be blown up by hidden mines. Move a fucking inch. <laughs> if they hadn't come and let me out, I'd have still have been in that shed waiting to become an officer. This is it. We're going in. Well, Meadows. How many VCs in the regiment? Five VCs. Name of the commanding officer? Lieutenant Colonel Hutchison. When was the regiment formed? 1685. Jesus Christ. Names of all the birds Arthur's had since he joined the army. Belinda? Yeah. Mabel? Yep. Alice? Ah, she was mine first. Janie? Who's that? Shall I show you how we prepare the dead?
I am back here with Rob Satino, the senior historian here at the National World War II Museum uh, in New Orleans. So you sort of hope throughout Overlord that uh, that Tom's premonitions uh, about his death are just though are, are, are nothing more than dreams. But it turns out, yeah. again, and and I, I was the rapidity of it, right? I mean, he doesn't even get off doesn't even get off the landing. He has a dream in which he's apparently running forward and gets shot. Right. But right. But, but that doesn't even happen. Yeah. Um, 
look, we know for a fact that on Omaha Beach, at least, and but t Tom is not on Omaha, but he's on one of the other land, one of the British beaches. We know for a fact on Omaha that, that, that many soldiers were killed in the boat. That is, the ramp went down, German machine gun fire opened up, and, and, and uh, individual soldiers were killed literally before landing. And, you know, that to me is... This movie goes through all that training, and he's taught to march, and he's taught how to address, and he's taught how to walk into a room, and he has a kind of bittersweet moment with a woman. It's it's a kind of, these things are in every single yeah. coming of age war film, and this one just has that twist at the end. But if you say Overlord isn't realistic because of this dream sequence or that, then I think you're missing the book. There was this idea that if you were fortunate enough to, when the door of the Higgins boat came down, you were able to get onto the beach. That no matter what, no matter how bad it was, no matter whether you were hit or not, you had to keep moving forward. Your chances of survival are, you know, pretty low. But here's where your chances of survival are zero if you just hunker down on the beach. Right. You're, you're being shot at. Eventually, there a bullet's going to find you, or a shell, or a mortar is going to find you, and and you're going to be killed. So. It's counterintuitive, Ben. Rushing toward an enemy machine gun might be the safest thing you can do at that time, at least safer than lying where you are, even though the instinct says lie. Uh, how many interviews with, with veterans do you think you guys have done who, who came ashore on D-Day? Yeah, it'd be an interesting count. So our number is somewhere over, over 10,000, but that's, of course, all theaters, all sectors, Pacific, Europe. But we have, at the very least, interviewed many, many hundreds. Uh, you know, one of our golden interviews here is with a private named Hal Baumgarten, who landed on Omaha Beach, and he got a bullet crease his helmet, and he got shot through the cheek, and he got shot through one jaw, got shot through the other jaw. Miraculously, he kept fighting. He was administering himself morphine by the, by the end of the day. You, you, you hear, and he, he tells you in a very, very matter-of-fact way, which is, of course, how veterans tend to talk about their service. They tend not to say, I was a hero. Right. They let other people say that, of, of course, and, and we do say that. But if you were on Omaha Beach or you, you were landed a, a anywhere in D-Day, you had to know that part of your survival was due simply to luck of the draw, as our, you know, as our man Tommy, our young soldier Tommy in this, uh, in this movie. It's kind of luck of the draw. There's a bullet, and it has his name on it, and it hits him at the end. But had he survived, would he have said, oh, I was a hero, I charged boldly ashore? Probably no chance, not. no chance. Yeah, in the, in the movie here, the wonderful film that, uh, that, that people, about 45 minute film that people can see if they, if they come to the World War II Museum uh, here, in, uh, here in New Orleans, I think it's from Eugene Sledge, who says, as he was preparing for the invasion of Japan, we knew we were, if you were alive at that point, you had cheated the law of averages. Yes, as a matter of fact, he, he says it even more memorably. He says, we were fugitives from the law. The law of averages. Yeah. Rob, thanks for the information. Thank Good you, stuff. Ben. Don't go away, everybody. Coming up next, a movie that has no similarities whatsoever to Overlord, but does have a lot in common with the movie we showed earlier tonight, The Longest Day. This is from 1977, A Bridge Too Far.